Hello everyone. I'm Stephanie. I'd like to tell you about the chest wall and the anatomy of respiration. Now let's start with the chest wall. This is the chest wall and as you can see the muscles and the bones and also the abdominal wall muscles. And the thoracic cage is the cage that covering the, the chest. It includes 12 thoracic vertebrae put posteriorly and 12 pairs of ribs and costal cartilages laterally and the sternum in front and it is roofed by suprapleural membrane and it is floored by the diaphragm. You can see the sternum in the picture. It has three parts, the manubrium, the body and the xiphoid process. The manubrium is the thickest and it has a jugular notch above and it articulates with the clavicles first costal cartilage and upper part of the second costal cartilage. The body of the sternum is about 10 cm long and it articulates with second to seven costal cartilages. And below there is a small cartilaginous C4 process. You can see the sternal angle here. It is the manubrial sternal joint and the joint between the manubrium and the body of the sternum. It is also known as the angle of Lewis. The ZV sternal joint is the joint between the body and the foot process. Now let's talk about the ribs. In the back, the rib articulate with vertebral column in two places, head and tubercles. They are called costal vertebral joints. In the front, the ribs join their costal cartilages. It's known as costal chondral joints. And the first two, seven ribs articulate with the sternum through their costal cartilages, called the sternal costal joints. And eight rib, nine rib, and ten rib articulate each other to form the interchondral joints. And eight costal cartilage articulate with seven costal cartilage to complete the costal margin. The remaining eleven and twelve ribs are free ribs. You can see rib. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And 1 to 7 articulate directly to the sternum through their costal cartilages. And 8, 9, 10 fuse in interchondral joints and then connect to the 7 costal cartilage to reach the sternum. And you can see small 11 and 12 ribs behind which are free, not connected to the sternum. This is the back view, the posterior view. You can see the head, neck, tubercle of the rib, of each rib, and the ankle and body of each rib. This is how it relates to the scapula in the right side. A typical rib has, has a head with two facets, which articulate with the corresponding vertebra and the vertebra above. They form synovial joints. And it has a neck with attachment to costal transverse ligament. And with a tubercle that articulate with transverse process of the corresponding vertebra. And the chef has an angle with attachment of the erector spinae and it also has a subcostal groove which is in the lower inner surface which let the intercostal vessels and nerves to pass. The typical ribs are third, fourth, fifth, 
six, seven, eight, and nine ribs. This is the picture of the typical rib. You can see the head with two facets and a neck and a tubercle with articular facet for transverse process of vertebra and an ankle, which is the most uh, most probable point of fracture. And you can see a thin subcostal groove in the lower surface. First rib, second rib, 10, 11, and 12 ribs are atypical ribs. First rib is the shortest, flattest, and most curved, and it is flattened above downwards, and it has a prominent scaly tubercle. Second rib is a similar one to the first rib, but it is less curved, and it is twice the length of first rib. Tenth rib is almost similar to a typical rib, but it, it is atypical because it has only one facet on head. And 11 and 12 ribs are free ribs, and they are short with no tubercles and single facet on head. The difference between 11 and 12 ribs is that 11 rib has shallow subcostal groove, but 12 rib has no subcostal groove. You can see first rib and second rib in this picture. First rib is very short, flat, and cut with a tubercle. Second rib is also short, flat, and cut, but it is about twice the size of first rib. Thoracic muscles are the muscles covering the chest wall. There are three muscle layers, external intercostals, internal intercostals, and innermost intercostals. They are continuous with that of the abdominal wall, and the neurovascular plane lies between the internal and innermost intercostals. Uh, you can see external intercostal and internal intercostals here. And you can see a dome of diaphragm in the left side. Uh, this is the more precise picture. And you can see external intercostal, internal intercostal, and innermost intercostals. The intercostal spaces are the spaces between the ribs, and it is filled by three thoracic muscles. Intercostal nerves and vessels lie between the internal and innermost intercostals in the subcostal groove of each rib. Uh, you can see the main artery and nerve lying between the inner two muscle layers. You can see the arrangement, which is VAN, vein, artery, and nerve. Intercostal vein lie most superiorly, and intercostal nerve most inferiorly. Intercostal arteries. There are posterior and anterior intercostal arteries that anastomosis in the space. First and second posterior arteries arise from the branches of the subclavian artery, but all the remaining intercostal arteries branches directly from the descending aorta. You can see the direct branch of intercostal artery from the aorta. And this is the first and second posterior intercostal artery which come out from, the, from a branch of subclavian artery. Intercostal veins, there are one posterior and two anterior intercostal veins in each space. They lie above the corresponding intercostal arteries in the costal groove. We have seen that before. And they drain to internal thoracic and azygous veins. This is where the 
the zygous vein and the endonatoracic veins lie. The intercostal veins drain into them. Let's see the intercostal nerves. They are the anterior rimae of upper 11 thoracic spinal nerve. You can see a small spinal cord in the spinal canal and it come out to give the spinal ganglion and spinal ganglion gives off posterior rimae and anterior rimae. Posterior rimae goes to the back muscles and anterior rimae goes into the intercostal space. These are the dermatomes uh, of the chest. This is also the cutaneous innervation of the chest. You can see T4 level at the nipple and T10 at the umbilicus level. C4 is the, supra, uh, is the clavicular region. And this is the back. Suprapleural membrane is also known as the Simpson's fascia. It is a dense fascial layer attached to the inner border of the first rib, first costal cartilage, and transverse process of C7 vertebra. The diaphragm is a dome fibromuscular sheet and it separates the thoracic and abdominal cavities. And it has two parts, the central tendon and the peripheral muscular part. The nerve supply is by the phrenic nerve, which has root value of C345. Its function is for inspiration. This is the diaphragm. It has three main openings, which is remember in the mnemonic of VOE. V for vena cable opening, O for esophageal opening, and A for aortic opening. Vena cable opening at T8 level in the central tendon and it transmits inferior vena cable and right phrenic nerve. Esophageal opening in the right press of diaphragm and it transmits esophagus and its relations which are vagus nerve and branches of left gastric vessels, aortic opening at T12 level and it transmits abdominal aorta, thoracic duct and zygous vein. It's remember in AT8. Abdominal aorta, thoracic duct and a zygous vein. So for the for the vertebral level and the opening, we can remember as VOA8 and 12. VOA8 and 12. Cable opening in T8 level, esophageal opening in T10 level, and aortic opening in T12 level. And other structures like greater and lesser static nerve pierce the diaphragm through the crura. And synthetic change passes behind the medial arcade ligament. You can see the cable opening, esophageal opening, and aortic opening. Again, cable opening, esophageal opening, and aortic opening. You can note the locations. Cable opening in the central tenon in the white part, esophageal opening in the crura right crust and aortic opening mostly behind the diaphragm in front of the vertebra. Let's talk about the anatomy of respiration. Breathing has two parts, the thoracic breathing and abdominal breathing. Thoracic breathing is carried out by the ribcage and the abdominal breathing by diaphragm. The movement of the ribcage and diaphragm combine to increase the volume of the chest and the negative intrapleural pressure is increased so the lungs expand so that the air goes in. 
the chest expands, the lung expands, and the air goes in. Then the chest requires, and the lung requires, and the air goes out. The thoracic breathing has two separate movements, pump handle movement and bucket handle movement. Pump handle movement is the up and down movement of anterior end of the rib, and it increases the anterior posterior diameter of the thorax. And the bucket handle movement is up and down movement of angles of the rib 4 to 7, and it increases the lateral diameter of the thorax. This is the pump handle movement. It increases the, the anterior posterior diameter and the bucket handle movement increasing the transverse diameter of the chest. Abdominal breathing is by the contraction of the diaphragm. When the diaphragm contracts, the central tendon descends to increase the vertical diameter of the thorax. The sand of the central tendon is arrested by liver and fixed central tendon elevates the lower six ribs. The chest content is increased and the air goes in. When the diaphragm relaxes, the air goes out. Normal quiet inspiration is by the combination of the thoracic and abdominal respiration. Forced inspiration requires the additional action of accessory muscles of respiration, that is, sternocleidomastoid, scalenes, pectoralis major and minor, and serratus anterior muscles. It is seen in pathological processes like asthma. Expiration is a passive process by the elastic recoil of lung and chest wall. Now let's move forward to the respiratory systems. The breathing involves so many organs, nose, mouth, throat, voice box, windpipe, airways and lungs. But here we are going to discuss only the intrathoracic organs. Trachea is a fibroelastic tube and it has a U shaped cartilaginous ring opening posteriorly and it is connected by smooth muscle called tracheolis posteriorly. It is 11 cm long. And it starts from the lower border of the cricoid cartilage to the tracheal bifurcation, also known as carina. And inner surface is lined by columnar ciliated epithelium containing goblet cells. It is supplied by inferior thyroid and bronchial arteries and venous drainage to inferior thyroid vein the lymphatic drainage to a pre- and paratracheal nodes and inferior deep cervical nodes. Trachea divides into right and left bronchi at D4-5. And the right bronchus is wider, shorter, and more vertical. It is 2.5 cm in length. And the left bronchus is 5 cm in length. They both enter the hilus of each lung. They divide to form intrapulmonary bronchial tree. The lungs are conical shape with blunt apex and concave base. Convex parietal surface and concave mediastinal surface. The hilum in each lung, also known as the root of lung, admits bronchi and vessels. Right lung is larger and it has three lobes 
divided by horizontal and oblique fissures. And left lung has only two lobes and it has only one oblique fissure. All the lobes are also known as upper and lower lobes. It has cardiac notch in its anterior border and there is a lingular between the cardiac notch and the oblique fissure. Each root of lung has main bronchus, pulmonary artery and two pulmonary veins. Each lung is divided into small separate segments called bronchopulmonary segments. There are 10 segments for each lung. Each segment is wedge-shaped, apex in the hilum, and each is supplied by a segmental bronchus, artery, and vein, and there is no communication with adjacent segments. So each segment can be removed separately without disturbance to these adjacent segments. Lungs are supplied by right and left pulmonary artery and bronchial arteries. The pulmonary arteries carry blood from the heart to the lungs for gas exchange. The bronchial arteries supply the air passages. In the pictures, you can see the bifurcation of the pulmonary artery lying in front of the bronchi. Pleura is a thin serous membrane and it has two layers, visceral and parietal pleura. Visceral layer is related to the lung surface and continues with parietal pleura at the root of the lung. Parietal layer lines inner aspect of the chest wall, the diaphragm and the mediastinum. A loose fold is formed below the root of the lung and allows for the distension of the pulmonary veins. You can see the purple shadow as a lung and blue shadow as the pleura. The apex of the pleura goes about 2.5 cm above the clavicle. It is also known as the cervical pleura. And each line of the pleural reflection meet in the midline at the sternal angle. Right pleura passes vertically down until the level of sixth costal cartilage, and it crosses eight rib at mid eight rib at mid clavicular line, ten rib in the mid axillary line, and twelve rib posteriorly. And the left pleura arches laterally at the fourth costal cartilage and descends downward and crosses 8, 10, 12 ribs in a similar way to the right. Both pleura descend below 12 rib at its medial extremity. When we talk about the surface anatomy of lungs, the apex of lungs follow the cervical pleura. The anterior border of right lung corresponds to right mediastinal pleura. Anterior border of left lung forms a cardiac notch behind 5th and 6th costal cartilages. Lower border is 2 rib above the level of pleura. It, it is 6 rib at mid clavicular line, 8 rib at mid axillary line, and 10 rib posteriorly. The oblique fissure is the, the inner border of scapula with arms fully elevated. And the horizontal fissure is only present in the right lung and it is horizontally and medially from the oblique fissure at the level of foot costal cartilage. You can see the surface markings here. Now let's talk about the clinical significance of what we have learned. Ribs lie very closely to many visceral organs. So rib fractures may damage underlying structures. 
causing pneumothorax, hemoneumothorax, and trauma to spleen and liver. Because spleen and liver lie partly beneath the thoracic cage. Cervical rib is an abnormal rib coming out from seven cervical vertebra. There are so many structures in the thoracic inlet, so many neurovascular structures in the thoracic inlet, so the cervical rib may cause vascular and neurological symptoms, which is collectively known as cervical rib syndrome. The intercostal nerve and vessels lie in the subcostal groove at the lower border of each ribs. So the insertion of chest strains should be close to the upper border of lower rib to avoid damage to the neurovascular bundle in the subcostal groove. Trachea may be displaced and compressed by pathological enlargement of adjacent structures like thyroid or arch of aorta. Right main bronchus is wider and more vertical, so it is more likely to admit foreign body. Pleura may be injured by the stubble neck or therapeutic procedures like central venous insertion to the subclavian or internatunicular veins. Needle through the left, fourth, and fifth intercostal space immediately lateral to the star edge and directly to the pericardium without transversing the pleura. We can use this anatomical knowledge during the pericardial aspiration, aspiration of the excess fluid from pericardial space. Pleura may be inadvertently open in the loin approach during surgery of kidney and adrenal glands because it extends slightly below the 12th rib at the medial extremity. These are the references for this lecture and you can search for more knowledges in this book. Thank you so much for your kind attention.